Hi, welcome to Philly Jazz Talks. I'm Suzanne Cloud, Project Director of the Philadelphia Jazz Legacy Project. And this evening, we're going to be talking with bassists Mike Boone and Daryl Beasley about some important Philadelphia bassists everyone should know about. Jimmy Garrison, Derek Hodge, Arthur Harper, Victor Bailey, Charles Fambro, and Tyrone Brown. But before we do that, it's important that you know that these monthly jazz talks are brought to you by the Philadelphia Jazz Legacy Project, an organization whose mission is to establish a permanent jazz archive of Philadelphia area jazz artists through recordings, video interviews, manuscripts, material culture like photographs, programs, posters, anything that relates to Philly jazz and its history. First, well, for the very first thing we want to do is to thank the Philadelphia Cultural Fund for sponsoring these monthly talks. And second, uh, I'd like to announce what's coming up next month. For May, I'll be talking with Dr. Diane Turner. She's the curator of the Bloxon Collection at Temple University. And uh, she has a book called Feeding the Soul, Black Music and Black Thought. So we'll be getting into... Uh, some of her scholarship next next month and possibly i'll be announcing another person who will be joining us so anyway to get a reminder of every event every month and other philadelphia jazz legacy work that we're doing please go to our website at philly jazz history very easy phillyjazzhistory.org and sign up for our monthly newsletter okay i'm glad to have you all right, I'm going to introduce the guys now, and uh, I'm so happy that they, 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 that they would do this. It's wonderful. I've known the, both of these bassists a long, long time. Um, Philly bassist Mike Boone is, unbeknownst to some, originally from New York, and he attended the prestigious Eastman School of Music. He was snapped up almost immediately after his education into the Buddy Rich Big Band, and soon after was touring with Ben Vereen. He moved to Philly in 18, in 18, in 19, ah. <laughs> 1983. You know, he's not that old. Feels like it. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. And that's, <laughs> after that, he found himself in the company of some really terrific local players and musicians, some legendary, definitely all of them giants, uh, including John Swana, Sid Simmons, Byron Landham, Shirley Scott, tons of musicians and community just grabbed onto Mike and, and held him held him fast. His albums as a leader, many of you on our hometown jazz label Dreambox, include Better Late Than Never, Yeah, I Said It, Heart and Soul, and live at Ort Leaves Jazz House, where he was part of the famous house band with Sid Simmons and Byron Landham for many, many years. Mike has been known as a primo mentor to many musicians coming through Philly or staying. So many, the Jazz Times calls him the jazz en engine, the Philadelphia jazz engine. So welcome, Mike. <laughs> Hi, Suzanne, how are you? I'm doing good. All right, let me early, now let me talk about Gerald. Yeah. Um, early on, a Philadelphian Gerald Beasley was noticed as part of the jazz fusion band Reverie, but he quickly began working with artists in R&B and gospel too. The list of the people he's collaborated with is long: uh, Grover Washington Jr., Joe Zalano, Nina Freelon, McCoy Tyner, Pat Martino. The Jaco Pistorius Big Band, Pieces of a Dream, Teddy Bendergrass, and the Dixie Hummingbirds. He's been the curator of the Unscripted Jazz Series at South Jazz Club in Philadelphia since 2015. And his passion for educating and motivating other musicians led Beasley to co found the Bass Boot Camp in 2002 which over the years has inspired hundreds of bass players at all levels, all ages, 
And it always looks like a good time when he's putting the pictures up of everybody at the end of the boot camp. It's, it's a lot of fun. Um, Gerald Veasley's contribution to arts advocate, advocacy is also longstanding. He has a, he's had a long time relationship with the Recording Academy where he served as chapter president. Gerald has also been recently selected to serve on the board of the Greater Philadelphia Cultural Alliance. And lastly, Gerald Veasley is also the president of Jazz Philadelphia, a nonprofit consortium of all the jazz organizations in the city and the major jazz advocate for jazz with the city of Philadelphia. Welcome, Gerald. Thank you so much, for Suzanne. Thanks for that wonderful intro. And it's just great to see your wonderful face here. I'm proud to be a part of this talk today. Thank you. Oh, okay. Um, now, I wanted to, before, I, before we get into it, I want to remind everybody that if you have questions, and I hope you do, you should have, uh, put them in the chat. So at the end, we've devoted about 10 minutes, 15 minutes, whatever, um, to talking about um, any of the questions, any, any questions you have for Gerald or for Mike. Uh, and we'll, we'll, we'll definitely get to them at the end, as many as we can. Okay, well, let's go. All right, Mike, why don't you tell us about the first, the first uh, one you're doing tonight? Okay, Suzanne, um, Gerald. First, hi, Gerald. Um, hi, Suzanne, everybody. And everybody yeah. out there. Wow, <laughs> it's kind of getting nervous. Anyway, <laughs> let's uh, got some notes over here because I want to try to be prepared. Uh, the first gentleman I'd, um, I've been asked to talk about is um, the late, great Jimmy Garrison. And um, wow, what can I say? Um, I guess when I was starting out um, on bass, my first in major influence was Ron Carter. And then I went back uh, and checked out Paul Chambers. And then much later, I got into um, Jimmy Garrison by way of the, um, John Coltrane's quartet. Uh, when I was with Buddy's band, this wonderful pianist um, who um, died a couple of years after I left the band, his name is Barry Kiner. Uh, he had this bootleg of um, John Coltrane's group with um, Jimmy Garrison, and I just wore that out. And for about three years after I left the band, that's all I listened to was was, was Train. And the thing about Jimmy Garrison, um, I didn't. Whereas Ron Carter was very clear and precise, and you could hear like his genius and how he did some you know did some things with Jimmy. I couldn't hear any. I couldn't tell you what he played. You know, I just could hear some stuff. I hear some rhythmic stuff. All I know, it just felt good. And the quarter notes were just like so fat. And it, it, he just grooved with Elvin in, in a way. And he just seemed to play the right, he just seemed to be right there in a way that was, I think he was the only one that really could do it. I know um, um, there were some other bass players. I know um, Reggie Workman played. But for me, Jimmy Garrison was that guy. And he just had a way of just negotiating. I guess he had to deal with three strong personalities who were also innovators on their instrument. I mean, Jimmy actually just had to find a way to play the bass a different way. And he had, I don't think he had anybody ahead before him that could show him that was doing that because I don't think anybody was playing the way Coltrane was playing. Nobody was voicing chords the way McCoy was, or and the feeling that um, Elvin was getting from the drums was very African esque, and he wasn't as opposed to like a Philly Joe Jones, a different kind of African. But what those guys were doing, so Jimmy had to find a way to play the bass, which involved listening. So he had to just hear what was going on and be strong. You know, they didn't have um, amplifiers. So just his sheer strength and just his feeling, you know, what you could hear, you know, he just kind of, I just kind of got stuck on him. And then I guess being in Philly, just kind of being, just being part of this lineage, it's, I just, he just became my guy. Um, along with Arthur Harper, who I definitely did get to, um, you know, see play and talk to. But Jimmy, he just represented so much. And just in terms of that feeling, 
And it was both swinging and funky at the same time. You know, I know we're going to be talking about electric players, but something about Philadelphia and all the, all those guys, they just had a certain lope. And I know Gerald was talking about it. And um, I think it's because we had so many different drummers. And I think mm -hmm. that's always been the case, you know, certainly since I've been got here in the, in the mid eighties and I'd imagine in, in the 50s you know we're going back 30 years before that i don't know how am i doing time wise should we um listen to the um jimmy yeah you you go ahead and cue that up when you're ready to cue up the uh the video just tell lex okay well i'll just say one more thing I, i'm just i'm just trying to keep track of the time the thing with jimmy um he like i said he developed his own way of playing a lot of times he do these extended solos and i think we're going to hear one of those and he almost treated the bass as another drum. I think all the, I think everybody in that quartet, you know, they were very percussive and they just kind of were in tune to that. And Jimmy just found a way to get a sound that was just so earthy and so um, just in tune and, and the, the pulse was so there and the note choice. I mean, he was, it was the right amount of being precise and nebulous and which i like i say there's just some new stuff going on so um and it just kind of you know i try to find that balance you know you don't you know you want to you want to leave things open you know and a lot of it's just hearing so I mean, he's he's my guy and you know so um yeah at this time yeah let's cue this up i think this is from um one of the many versions of impressions um, two written by John Coltrane, and um, I think it's at the end of um, McCoy's solo, if I'm not mistaken, or some, somewhere in there, but he's playing an extended solo, and you just get to hear some different stuff, and um, it's kind of vintage um, Jimmy Garrison, so Alex, whenever you're, re whenever you're ready, you can cue that up. See, all right. It's great. It sounds wonderful. I remember this. Wow. 
I mean, come on, man. Come yeah. on. It doesn't get any better than that. Yeah. <laughs> come on. Great, cho- great, great choice, Mike. <laughs> I was I didn't really listen to it. I just saw it and I'm listening listening now and it's like it's like he's playing like a folk tune and he's playing some funky kind of stuff. I mean that could have been like some Motown and he's like doing this thing where it sounds like it's like some primitive, you know, instrument, some kind of, you know, something like, like you know, he's like he's all over the place and he's like, you know, it's like all those guys, they just really maxed out. I mean, they just they did they did more than play the bass and it's like it's it's like it's like so much. I mean, I just wow. It's like, <laughs> come on, and, and it's funny because it's like there was like he grew up Reggie Workman, Arthur Harper, Spanky DeBress, and a whole bunch of other folks that we don't even know about. I just think that there was a bunch of guys that just kind of they had they they had some. I mean, maybe not to the extent of Jimmy. I mean, who knows? I mean, that's the that's the unknown. I mean, it's just like Jimmy was like. But anyway, you know, I just hope. You know, and then when he starts walking, it's just like, and then J- train comes in, and it's. Yeah. <laughs> and I'm sorry. It's like, what can I say? I mean, how no, long, how old was that? What was that done in the '60s? It's like 2021. Yeah. And it's yeah. still like, come on, it's still fresh. You know, it's, it's still, it's still going to be fresh. You know, 40 years from now, even right, more so. Right. Now. Anyway, so um, what 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 are we what am I doing now? All right. Well, now we're we're, <laughs> we're going to have Gerald introduce. Uh, the next uh, basis on our list is uh, Derek Hodge. Uh, so, Gerald, why don't you take that up for us? I want you to put the picture up, Lex, of Derek. Yep, yep, yep. So, uh, first of all, thanks. This is a great project. So, uh, this is really exciting. First of all, to hear Mike Boone, you know, try to hold back his enthusiasm, which is really tough. <laughs> Yeah, <laughs> and yeah, I it'll never it. happen. <laughs> I'm getting worse. The older I get, because yeah. uh, that clip was certainly inspiring. So, uh, a little bit about Derek Hodge. So, he's a bass player who plays both electric and upright, mm-hmm. and uh, he grew up in Philadelphia, but also he has roots in Willingboro. So, you yeah. know, as Philly musicians, we also claim Willingboro not just because it's so close, but because so many great musicians. We're educating yes. the school system over there. And Absolutely. he's probably, certainly one of them and went on to study at Temple University in that great program. And uh, what I love about him is we had him come to the base boot camp to do some teaching a couple of years ago. And he was very transparent about what he knew, but also what he didn't know. And I love that he's, even the, that all these accomplished, he's just dedicated himself to being a lifelong student. I mean, just talking about all the hours he would spend as a young student, just hanging out in the library, just trying to figure out how scores worked and um, Mm -hmm. how to become a better composer. And that's led to him to not only have a career as a recording artist, as a sideman, but also as a, as a film composer, he's really making his mark there. And um, the first time I heard them though, actually was an, on an R&B record. It was a record that caught my attention because my wife loved it. She would play it all the time. It was a mm-hmm. Maxwell Black Summer Night record. Uh-huh. And, uh, uh-huh. In that band was also Rear Hardgrove. So the, the musicians in the band, even though it was an R&B record, it had this other thing to it. And uh, you're not gonna Ooh. get that today, but um, Derek Hodge is playing these lines that are so interesting and rock solid, but inventive. And he later on went to be, became the music director for that band. He's, he's been on some gospel uh, Grammy award winning records, not just with Maxwell, but also with Robert Glasper, mm-hmm. who you can tell when the clip that we'll play in a couple of minutes, you'll hear that kind of Glasper connection. Uh, you'll also hear how now a lot of these younger players and newer players are really experimenting with time and how the rhythm is really very, very liquid. And even the approach to playing the bass, it's at once rooted, but also very melodic. Mm -hmm. Uh, His use of chords is is very, very interesting. Um, The other thing I'll say about his uh, playing is that you'll hear kind of this collision of styles in in the same way that the the Garrison um, clip, you kind of pulled out, um, Mike, how you hear the, the folk song approach in there. You're hearing the African music, you're hearing jazz. I think in a lot of these players that you'll hear today, you'll hear sort of this collision of styles and how 
these musicians aren't shying away from any particular style in order to be authentic. Yeah. They're using everything in their toolbox. So certainly you'll hear some of that in, um, in um, Derek Hodges' music. He's just one of the fantastic young players out there. And again, you'll hear him on this clip playing electric, although he does play upright. He's actually recorded three albums for um, Blue Note. And this is from his first recording. It's a song called Dances with Ancestors. And uh, also you'll, uh, well, let's let's little play and we'll talk about it a little bit afterwards, but this is uh, Derek Hodge. of his playing. Yeah. And I just got to give a quick shout out to a couple of my favorite bass players who are uh, joining us. Chico Huff. Whoa. Oh, Whoa. my goodness. You talk about a lot of mercy. And Steve ah. Bestrown, who is ah. a, uh, <laughs> like, Steve, like everybody's favorite bass player. You know? Yes. Like, Jesus. So they're part of this legacy, too. That's so right. Steve and Chico, man. Big, mm. Much respect mm. to them. Yes. But yeah, you can hear in his playing sort of this swirling approach to the rhythm and you can hear the singing like the, from that gospel influence and um, mm. the use of chords you know uh, that really strikes um, it really hits me because when I the first bass player I ever really got inspired by was Stanley Clark and what inspired me was how he had this infectiousness and his when I saw him with uh, Return to Forever, which was the first group I saw him play with, I was used to bass players kind of standing in the back and kind of waiting for their time to make it a couple of bar to, to step out. But just seeing somebody like coming, at, as a, coming out as a co-equal in that band blew my mind. But now you can see with um, people like Derek Hodge, it's more or less accepted that bass players can lead bands and bass players can be out front and they can express themselves melodically. Yeah. That was cool. It reminded me a little bit of Sir, of, of Jocko too, with some of his more mystical albums mm -hmm. when he goes into that swirling, swirling way of, uh, you know, lengthening some notes, making other uh, notes a little bit shorter, but blending it all together into some, you know, an amalgam that really is lovely to listen to. That was that was a lovely record. I think now I have to go out and get that record. You know, yeah, yeah he's a beautiful, <laughs> player. beautiful player. All right, well, well, next we're doing very good on time, guys. Thumbs up. Yeah, okay. <laughs> good, good, good. All right. 
All right, Mike, uh, next up is Arthur Harper. Lex, can you put up a picture of Arthur? That's by, by, by the way, this, this still uh, I got from Jason Fifield. I sent the, the Legacy Project has an awful lot of old, um, uh, old uh, videos from the Willingboro Jazz Festival, talking about Willingboro. And this picture is of Arthur Harper, Harper in 1992 at the Willingboro Jazz Festival. And on this one, he's playing with uh, Ori Kane and uh, I think uh, Alan Nelson on drums, um, uh, John Swana and Alexander Evans. <laughs> And uh, so we are, I'm putting them out with our newsletter so you can see them. So please sign up. All right, go ahead, Mike. Tell us about Arthur. Okay, Arthur Harper. Um, wow. Uh, like I said, I, I met him. Uh, first of all, shout out to Chico and Steve Bestron. Now, now I'm really nervous. Um, <laughs> but anyway, um, Arthur. Yeah, I met him at Ortlieb's. Um, I'd never heard of him, um, but um, he was playing with Shirley Scott and Mickey Roker. They were part of the house band. They were the original trio. They were like the guys, um, well, the, the, the group. They played um, at least every Friday and Saturday. Sometimes they played back then. You, they had sets Thursday, um, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, and Saturday. Bootsy took over the Wednesday. So you had Thursday, Thursday, Friday, Saturday, but usually the Fridays and Saturdays that they were playing. And um, Harper, he came up with um, Jimmy Garrison and all those bass players um, in the 50s. Uh, he was born, well, I guess I knew, he was born in, yeah, I got notes right here. He was born in um, Asheville, North Carolina. And um, his um, grandfather was a Baptist minister, uh, kind of like my grandfather, who, um, who was in Austin, Texas. I didn't know that until I read some stuff on him. He grew up in Philadelphia, and he came up playing with the um, Heath brothers, the Bryant brothers, um, Ray Bryant, the pianist, and Tommy Bryant, the bassist, um, and Lee Morgan and a bunch of other folks. Um, he was real tight with... Um, Reggie Workman, and I believe um, Reggie married his sister, or he might something. They're kind of like brother you know, brother in laws, or they were. Um, Arthur moved up to New York um, in the early '60s, and actually, I think he dropped out of high school and went on the road with some people. Um, people may not know this, but he played with sure um, Betty Carter for a little bit. He and he and Mickey Roker played with um, Mary Lou Williams for a while. Uh, he started doing some things. He was with JJ trombonist JJ Johnson for about twelve years. Uh, he's actually on a was a video with him playing with Paul Winter, um, the saxophonist. Um, he's actually the founder of what they so called new age music that came out. I guess in the seventies, this kind of free like free kind of stuff. But anyway, before that, he was a, a hardcore bebopper, and um. There's a video out with Arthur and Ben Riley playing drums. But anyway, fast forward to Arthur. Um, I would listen to these guys. And Arthur, I think he was, well, I know. He was he was as heavy as Jimmy. He could have easily have played um, with um, Train. You know, he would have been a little different. He had the same look that the Philly guys had, that same kind of funky thing. I think um, solo-wise, he might have been a little more clear in terms of stuff he played rhythmically he did some tricky stuff it's funny all these guys had they, they played with time but they could play time going back to Derek hodge he when he played upright he sounded a lot like jimmy garrison in terms of playing the bass and, and taking care of business so that's that's the thing uh arthur he it took him a while to warm up to me because when i first started listening to him i was just playing um electric exclusively i was just starting to switch over switch back to upright um a bunch of us switched over around the same time i think lee smith steve bestgrown daryl hall and myself we all kind of made that plunge but anyway arthur i would come in i would try to sit in and he would never let me play so like he did that like four times and then the fifth time shirley so i let him play so i played my electric and i played everything i tried to play everything i knew, and i did okay and so he kind of 
he pulled me aside and he, he used to talk like this is okay now play it on acoustic i said oh. <laughs> so that's when i broke down and you know he was right and the rest was history but anyway arthur you know I, we were blessed having him because he was an original and like i said he was on the same level as a uh Reggie Workman as a as anybody as Ron anybody I think the people in New York they knew he was that good guys like Kenny Barron they knew who he was and he was kind of his own worst enemy you know not to get into that some of us we all sometimes we're our own worst enemies so um I think he could have been on a lot more records been a lot more well known but that ended up being a blessing for folks in Philadelphia because we got to hear just genius you know he he, um he also knew all the answers to a lot of um trivia questions he was just a real smart guy and the way he played um so it was just to hear him with mickey and shirley and you know there's no disputing their um genius and their what their effect they had on the music so just this trio he was very he was very much an equal partner so i learned a lot just about you know from just playing the bass from an individual and i think i had picked up some things that some other bass players that who weren't around you know they weren't able to get because they didn't hear arthur so i just feel blessed in that respect uh so maybe we should play the video um video and this is from ortley like i said that's where i heard him the um audio is pretty good the, um it's kind of dark in there but that's how jazz was. You played in dark places and you, <laughs> you drank and you hung out. And you did, you know, that was the school. Ortley's was our higher education. And back in the day, you know, that's a whole nother thing. Um, we had those kind of places regionally. If any major city had those kind of places. Ortley's was was that place. People would come in and, and sit in and, and from out of town. And these were the guys that would play. Anyway, here we go. Play that. I'm sorry.
What just happened? What did I just do? Lex? Uh, Mike, we can, he we can hear you just fine, and we can see you. Okay, I just did something. With, okay, good. I'm sorry. I just I tried something with my headphones. So, oh, oh, good. Um, yeah, I don't. Well, yeah, it was, it was Arthur. It, Go ahead. You good. Well, I just wanted to say something. It of watching that clip it just made me miss Orpheus all over again. I really th that place was just the center of being for Philly jazz for so long. In fact, uh, the, the Jazz Legacy Project. I'm going to be interviewing um, Pete Souter about uh, his ownership of of uh, Ortley's. We got to get that on on video. So we're going to be doing that within the next couple of weeks. So, but thanks for bringing that in, Mike. Go ahead. No, I was going to say, I mean, yeah, I, I, that's where I learned. That was the, the school of higher education. I mean, that's where we all learn. But that's where Sid and Byron and myself, I mean, we would watch um, Harper and Mickey and Shirley. And not only that, we'd hang out with them at the bar. We'd listen to them, you know, just talk about all kinds of things. And um, with Harper, the thing about him, when he would solo every day after they'd play a chorus and then um, Shirley and Mickey would drop out. And for years and years, I could never follow him. I would always get lost. Like I didn't get lost this time. And I think out of all those times, I think two times I was able to follow him. And one time I was, I was so drunk. I don't know. I was, I was in the midst of something. I mean, I was like so gone. And for some reason, maybe he was, you know, we were in sync some kind of, but I could follow him. I just knew where it was. I mean, because he was, the beat would kind of move around, but there was phrases he would play. And it was like, for some reason I got it. And this time I, you know, so it was just interesting. He, it, and they would say, um, well, how do you follow him? And Shirley would just say, just listen. And as you could hear, it was just some real, just a real, a, a real authentic individual, you know, way of playing that was as good as anybody. So I, like I said, I just feel really blessed to really, well, all of us to, that we really had a chance to hear him and function that way. He knew a lot, a lot of tunes and he just always had a solid beat. And he was, um, I think he's unsung and hopefully, you know, people you know fine because he's on some things there's some albums it might be like maybe 10 or you know 10 or 12 albums there's some stuff with shirley um shirley scott trio they did live at um i, I think it was birdland the old birdland that's on the candid rec the candid record label and that's a good representation it doesn't really do justice you had to hear them live you had to, like right. you said you, you had to be in the place with all those people making noise and whatever i mean it wasn't the best place the other thing too and then i'll we'll move on it wasn't it wasn't the best place in terms of hearing the music because a lot of stuff was going on it wasn't like uh but the energy was there and you had to play through a lot of stuff you know but which is all a testament to just how strong they were because they just had to kick it out and it yeah. <laughs> just, it was just another kind of you know a, from another another time gone past you know, just, <laughs> anyway i'm done come on gerald <laughs> <Come here. laughs> uh, gerald's going to talk about um uh another phil uh, comes from a philly jazz family um mars Mo Bailey, um, he's going to talk mm -hmm. about Victor Bailey. Go ahead, Daryl. Yeah, so, uh, and I always have to kind of dovetail on what Mike has just talked about because that idea of having to play through stuff <laughs> in the clubs, that's part of the Philly tradition too in terms yes. of getting stronger, you know, in terms of your, um, yeah, it's just not just your musicianship, but like your will to get things across, especially as a bass player, when everybody drops out. <laughs> mm -hmm. So uh, yeah, so we, we, we uh, people often ask, well, what is it about Philly that's created these bass players? And I think, you know, there is just, Philadelphia is such a, you know, it's known as a blue collar town and it's known as a, you know, a lunch pail town and people want the real thing. Mm -hmm. You know, you can't 
pretend it's got to be authentic and it's and if people are talking over your solo play better the next time <laughs> yeah turn up or something yeah. so anyway someone who was not shy about uh expressing himself victor bailey <laughs> wonderful wonderful bass player he, he left us far too soon mm -hmm. and he's no longer with us but i mean he he left along a body of work that includes over a thousand recordings um two solo albums that i'm aware of and uh one of the standout uh, his first album one of the standout pieces a song called kid logic which is just yes. um but you know i'll just read a few of his credits it's everybody from weather report to madonna hugh massacala which is kind of what uh, launched his career to mary j blige sonny rollins miriam mccaba lenny white don elias Lori larry coriel sadao watanabe my Michael Urbaniak, Kenny Kirkland, my, uh, Mike Stern, Michael Brecker, it, it, the list goes on and on. I mean, he was really, in his day, he was probably the most sought after bassist in New York. And uh, I had the chance to meet him. You mentioned Morris Bailey. I met him at Morris Bailey's house because Morris was doing some arranging and producing, arranging for my uncle for Ira Tucker and the Dixie Hummingbirds. And, uh, you know, this this kind of pre-session, um, you know, this young bass player comes up to me and uh, he's he said, do I know anything about Weather Report? And I think Victor was going to be 16 at the time. And I, I started playing my favorite tune at that time, which was Cuc Cucumber Slumber, which yeah. featured uh, Alfonso Johnson. Alfonso Johnson, another and he, guy. And he was like, yeah, that's cool, but that's not how it goes. And I'm like, wait a minute. Now you're 16, you little twerk. Yeah. <laughs> and then he played it. And I was like, you know what? That does sound more like it than what I played. <laughs> and then he explained, he said, well, I know Al Alfonso Johnson. So even in those early years, it also looks like he was he was destined to play with Weather Report. As it turns out, um, I just read this recently. He started off as a drummer. I didn't know that. And he just kind of fell into playing the bass because the drummer all of a sudden, uh, the bass player wasn't available. And he had never had a lesson on the bass. And he just picked it up. And he had this, he was very schooly. He ended up going to Berkeley, but he has this amazing ear for music and this melodicism and maybe the, the fact that his groove is so strong comes out of having been a drummer. Um, we were fortunate to have him uh, teach at the bass boot camp. In those early days of the bass boot camp, though, he didn't really think of himself as an educator. Even though he had gone to Berkeley, he was like, man, I don't really teach. But what he would do is he would have people play and then he would critique them. And we found that that was just as valuable as, as somebody saying, put your hand, put your finger here or do this or do that, but just to really give feedback. He was a brutally honest musician and uh, I miss him. I miss him dearly. Oh, um, his uh, sister Brenda called us after he passed, called us out of the blue. One day called uh, Roxanne and me unexpectedly and um, said that he had left um, a gift in his will for the bass boot camp. That's how much it meant to him. And I, that just blew me away. So we actually started a scholarship fund in his favor. But someone who didn't think of himself as a teacher, although in later years he taught quite a bit when he was touring less, uh, touring more. He's also a visual artist. So he's got this kind of 360 approach to making music. Uh, in this video that you're about to hear, um, get ready for something that's really astounding. When he, when he was at, and he'll explain it, uh, some of the work that he was doing at Berkeley, which is doing a lot of transcriptions. Um, but this tune you're going to hear is mind blowing. And he doesn't just transcribe a chorus or two, but it's pretty amazing. And this is one of the things that he's been known for too, which is his scat, soloing his scat playing. So. This is uh, Victor Bailey, our good friend, and he'll announce what he's about to do. So let the clip roll. OK. 
Okay, this is just a visual lesson. This when I went to Berkeley 35 years ago, I transcribed a bunch of cold train <laughs> solos, including this one, which is Countdown. This is from my record. It was with Lenny White, Dave Kikoski on piano, Ron Carter on acoustic bass. I'm playing cold train solo. This is just a play along with the record. It'll give you a visual idea of what's possible if you want to practice enough. <laughs> I think I was holding my breath for like three minutes. Incredible. What a great Unbelievable. <laughs> um, I don't know what it, what is it to say about that, except, you know, I think sometimes we overlook when we talk about people who are um, musical geniuses, we overlook how much hard work goes into accomplishing what it is you want to. You don't just wake up and start doing that. No. You know, that requires some effort and time and repetition. And it requires, you know, having great ears and facility and all that. But it's um, you can see that as much as we think about some of these musicians as natural musicians, part of their genius is their work ethic, you know, and the commitment and how serious they are about about music and about the bass. So much respect, Victor. Love you. Yes, yes, yes. What, what uh, wonderful. All right, um, Mike. Now uh, you're going to talk about uh, Charles Fambro. Well, before I talk about Charles Fambro, right. I, I, I need to talk a little about about Victor. Okay. And I'm, you know, um, well, first of all, I knew more. I knew Morris a little. You know, I'm, you know, sorry, I got to get myself together. I knew Morris a lot better than than Victor, but I met Victor. And we were tight and thing we shared in common. And I'm just going to say this. Victor went to school with all those guys in Berkeley. And I, he played all that fusion stuff. But I know part of him really wanted to play some straight ahead with, with those cats he played with. And those guys got out of school and they went into this unplugged stuff where he wouldn't allow electric bass. And I know that kind of messed with him. I mean, he did well, but he could play jazz. And he could swing harder than most of the damn upright players I was out. And it kind of pisses me off. I'm sorry <laughs> about that. But it's like he, he was... Ah! 
<laughs> he could play and he knew that music. He came up with those guys and they know who they are and they blocked them, but that's okay. You got paid a lot more, but it's just seeing that. He could walk the bass. It wasn't just about practicing solos. He could play the bass. He yeah. knew that music. He just played it on electric bass. Anyway. Okay. I just wanted to say that. Anyway, who am I talking about? Charles Bro. Well, first of all, don't apologize because we needed that. That was yeah. a moment we uh, needed. And, and the other thing, too, of all these Philadelphia got Chico Hop and Steve <laughs> Besco, all these guys. We all could swing <laughs> on electric bass. <laughs> Fuck. <laughs> oh, oh, oh. Ah! Anyway, Charles Bros Broski, Broski, Charles Broski. Right. Shout Nadine. out to Nadine, who's here. Nadine, hi Nadine, how you doing, dear? I hope Dolores all love to all y'all. Broski didn't like me when we first met. <laughs> I he I had to prove myself to him. I had to prove myself to Harper, but that's okay. It was funny. I first met Charles. I didn't really meet him. I saw him play. It was back in, I think it was the mid eighties. I think I was with Buddy Rich and we were doing a week at um, uh, the Blue Note and he was playing the after hours. He was playing with a piano player named Rodney Kendricks, wonderful pianist um, and a drummer, Jerry Gibbs. And they were doing a jam session and Charles was playing and, and he was up in New York. He was in the mix doing a lot of stuff. And I sat in um, and it was okay. But years later, he moved back to Philly and um, it was weird. Like he would come in and he, 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 he was nice to everybody else, but he was a little kind of standoffish to me. I, I couldn't really figure out why, but um, eventually, you know, he heard me play and um, he liked what I was doing. And we got tight one time because he was playing somewhere at Chris's. That's when Chris's had the music in front. And that's what, years ago when they had the Republican convention. I don't know if you remember that. Uh, and those guys came over and they were saying at the Union League and Charles was playing. It's funny, Lenny White was playing. And these guys were making a lot of noise. And Charles asked them to, politely to be quiet. And they said like the F word. And Charles put his bass down. And I tried to say, Charles, you know, we can't fight these guys. And to make a long story short, we almost ended up like rumbling these guys. And Dolores li literally picked me up and just like placed me somewhere else and just kind of, and I was like, wow. So from that point on, we just got like super, well, pretty tight, you know, because I guess he saw, wow. Because before then, he didn't really know what to think, but I guess he saw, well, we, you know, we'll just go ahead and run. We'll try. I don't know what I would have done. I mean, Charles was a big guy, so he, he definitely could have taken care of himself. I don't know. I think that's why Dolores kind of picked me up out of and put, put, moved me out of the way. But anyway, we just got really cool after that. And, you know, I just really, um, I don't know. I just, uh, that first album that he came out with, his debut album, The Proper Angle, which was on, um, CTI records and recorded at Van Gelder that had like the um, the Marsalis brothers that Kenny Kirkland, Jeff Watts also had, um, um, I think Jerry Gonzalez and Steve Berrios and I believe Roy Hargrove was on some and his writing, um, Charles, Charles was, I know I'm kind of rambling. Charles was kind of, he, he was, he came up with Stanley Clark. So he was also a guy that played um, upright and electric he was a 70s guy, so he came up playing a lot of different kind of styles, but he eventually kind of stayed with the upright mostly. And he played with um, Art Blakey for a number of years, and um, he was one of, um, I don't know if he was the first bass player to play with Winton, but I know he's on that first record and um, when Winton first came out. And um, Broski, he just like us, he was just another Philadelphia bass player. He had this lope, you know, he had this energy in his playing, but he also wrote very and just heavy tunes. You know, he didn't, you know, he didn't really believe in doing a lot of soloing. He was just a, just a, he was in that lineage. What can I say? But I think his compositions, his arranging, um, he was a, a consummate musician. And also, I think he used some of, um, Victor Bailey's artwork for one of his, um, I think Upright Citizen has one of um, Victor's um, drawings on it. So, um, yeah, and um, I was fortunate enough to play one of um, um, Charles's um, 
celebrations, you know, after he passed. I was honored to do that. And um, he's somebody I miss too. I mean, I just feel like, wow, you know, it's just nice that we, you know, just formed a bond. And I think towards the end, um, we were cool. And, and that's always good. And I just, I miss him too. I miss all those guys. I mean, it's just like, wow. You know, I just feel blessed to be part of that. And, um, you know, it's just, I don't know. I think we should hear him right now. This this clip we're going to hear, I think it was from one of the shows, um, I think BET, uh, what's his name? Ramsey Lewis, one of, he had a series. And I think the show was filmed in um, DC, if I'm not mistaken. And this is one of Charles's most famous compositions. It's titled right. Little Man. Yeah. And he yeah. recorded on a bunch of different um different groups and this is with um i think bill o'connell's on um piano um joe ford's on soprano sax steve barrios was on kunga and i'm not sure who the drummer is so I, if anybody knows please um let me know you see him towards the end of the clip i'm sorry go ahead wonderful what a great tune what a great tune yeah, yeah, yeah. i could have listened to another half hour of that. oh yeah yeah yeah, yeah and, and with charles it's like you know he's just he's just like a groove machine man. he's just kind of <laughs> and he always had these like really like like basic he had just this basses that he had they were like these like really expensive just really ringy basses and he just got a really growly kind of sound I know he he told me a story once. I think his second album, I think it's called The Charmer. And it starts with him playing a low F, which is like your E string in your first position. And this note just you hear it, it just rings. It's just bah. I mean, it's just like crazy. And I asked him about it. And I said, What 
<laughs> what's up with that note? You know, and he said, well, what he did was he got, <laughs> you'll like this, he got an A string and tuned it down to E. Ah. <laughs> so now, so, so when he hit that note, it's like, it's flappy. So it just like, so that note just sounded like bigger. Than, I mean, that's the first note of people. It's like, he could have just ended the album right then. He just, oh, no, thank you. Good night. You know, you're like, you know, what else do you need to hear? But anyway, he just was, you know, just that kind of guy. And, and he wrote all kinds of stuff. I mean, he wrote a beautiful songs for his, his daughters, his wife. And, um, I think it's um, for his son, and he's just um, yeah, uh, one of one of one of the many 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 guys. Um, All right. Well, I'll let me put in here because I just want to tell everybody we're going to be getting to questions. We got one more basis to, to go, and then we'll get we're going to be going over a little bit. So okay. just uh, this. that's all right. Oh, wow. it's, not your, it's not your mm -hmm. fault, Mike. Yes, it is. It <laughs> is too it? much. Of course it is. Who else? <laughs> Sorry. Okay. All right. I'd like to, uh, Gerald's going to talk about uh, Tyrone Brown. Yeah, yeah. And real quick about uh, Frambro. It's like, man, just, you know, I think sometimes people, Frambro was somebody who had a lot of confidence and a lot of what they would call today swagger. Wow. But I think sometimes it's misunderstood, like musicians who carry themselves that way. It's they care so deeply about getting the music right. You know, they may come off as being like abrasive or something like that. But uh, knowing Frambro, he was like super, super serious about the music being right. Yeah. And you could tell his commitment when he's playing, like the commitment to every single note, his whole mm -hmm. body and his whole spirit mm -hmm. is in every note. And uh, yeah, like you said, miss him. Tyrone Brown, a great way to kind of wrap this up because um, Tyrone is like the Renaissance man on the mm -hmm. bass. Not just a great bass player, but a composer and author. Uh, really, somebody who's a just a brilliant human being, and has uh, I, like one of the most recognizable sounds on the bass. Um, I, I kind of look at myself as somebody who's kind of followed in his footsteps sort of like wherever his path I would kind of try to trail along um you know he, he worked with Odin Pope when he got tired of working with Odin Pope I worked with Odin Pope <laughs> <laughs> you know he, he worked with Grover and then later I worked <laughs> with Grover he worked with Locksmith I worked with Locksmith he played with Pat Martino I, so, so Suffice it to say, if it hadn't been for Tyrone Brown, I wouldn't have a career at all. No, no, stop. <laughs> stop. No, so, <laughs> a, a few of the people he's played with, uh, this is just a crazy list uh, in terms of just the wide selection. Lou Rawls, Billy Paul, Freddie Hubbard, Phil Woods, Mulgrew Miller, Clark Terry, Johnny Hartman. We could be all here all day. Benny Golson, mm -hmm. uh, Dizzy Gillespie, Cecil Bridgewater, Stanley Tarantino. And of course, as I mentioned, Odie Pope, Grover Washington Jr., Pat Martino, and probably his, his claim to fame is all the years he spent working with uh, Max Roach. It may have been something like 26 years as part of the Max okay. Roach Quartet. Um, he's got an incredible sound, you know, that kind of singing sound that you were talking about from uh, the year uh, in Charles Farnborough's playing. You certainly hear it in... Um, and Tyrone Browns, he's kind of like one of the quintessential players, not just on the upright, but also on the electric upright. I think he's one, maybe one of the most well-known people for playing that instrument. Uh, a quick story about that. I think when when Max uh, auditioned for the chair after the former bass player had left, one of the things he was looking for was a bass player that a bass player that had a bass that wouldn't give them headaches when they were traveling in Europe and having to deal with the overhead and the cartage and all that. Sure. And Tyrone Brown came up with the perfect practical solution, but also he was a great musical solution for that um, cordless band. So the the clip you're going to hear now is of uh, <laughs> of uh, him playing with the Max Roach Quartet. Not sure of the song. You can see the year. You'll see it posted 1990. It starts off with uh, just the tail end of an incredible uh, Odin Pope solo. 
Um, I wish you, you can go back and check out the clear clip on your own, but you'll hear how, while everything is, seems to be in outer space, um, Tyrone is playing these bass lines that are totally grounding the whole um, occasion, but yet he, you can hear these, these kind of virtuosic touches, even when he's playing, just uh, supporting the soloist. But now you're going to hear in his solo, one of the things is he, he's really made his mark on, which is unaccompanied bass solos. In fact, he wrote uh, a book about it, which uh, has all of these bass, play, bass, unaccompanied bass solos that we can learn from. You'll hear elements of classical and flamenco and jazz. And oh, just real quick, he also played on one of the, the funkiest albums of all time, which is Live at the Bijou. Right. Yes. Junior. So with that said, check out yes, the great Tyrone Brown with the Max Roach Quartet. <laughs> Gerald, what a wonderful oh, clip. Well, man, I mean, 
Tyrone is just, he's hes kind of, he owns that space. I mean, if you just heard that mm-hmm. being a bass player without seeing who it was, you would know it's Tyrone Brown. Yeah. You know, his vibrato and all of that, that's is so identifiable and so personal. And again, uh, just some a renaissance man who's truly brilliant, you know, a deep thinker and a, and a renaissance uh, person as a musician, but as an author. Um, you know, much respect to Tyrone. Um, and I was ca- half joking when I said I wouldn't have a career, but it's it's funny um, how many in in, Phil- in Philadelphia in the bass community how we've we've done a good job through the years of referring each other for for jobs. Me, you know, it's just, part of the love that we have for one another. Yeah, let me let me jump in here real quick because it's funny you said that. And to be honest. Uh, and I'll, I'll I'll be done. I owe Tyrone a lot because when I first came to Philly, the first place I went into was Slim Cooper's and Tony Williams, a saxophonist who's still with us. He's like 89 years um, old. And um, he was playing and Tyrone and the late, great Eddie Green and Al Jackson was playing. And anyway, I got to meet Tyrone and um, he heard me play and he literally, you know, called all his contacts and said, look, there's this new guy in town. And if I can't do a gig, I mean, seriously, he really did this because I started yeah. getting calls and everybody said the same thing. Tyrone was Tyrone was like when he wasn't in um on tour, you know, he was doing like all the time. I mean, he was the man. He was definitely the man, but he literally called everybody. And I didn't know, you know, like, you know I didn't, and he literally said, look, call this guy. And I would he really he single-handedly a bunch of other people but he was he he was that first guy that gave that first push that told everybody that was booking people about me so i i definitely owe him a lot you know so i definitely you know so my it's funny you said that you know about the career so he he, i think i think we all do mike because i i know being mentored by eddie green and him because they always came as a team for me and you know it was (laughs) So if I hired sure. Eddie, I'd hire Ty. Sure, you know? sure. So, and yeah. Uh, yeah, Ty's been a longtime friend, and I, mm. I, he taught me so much musically that it's I couldn't even put it into one book. It would be a, like a twenty-four volume set, you know. Mm. So, mm. I'll say one but, other thing before we leave Tyrone Brown. If I could just sure. interject and say this, I, I think um, one of the things that I think is important for young musicians is to have somebody to look up to. Mm-hmm. You know, and Tyrone Brown was always that, right? Mm-hmm. Somebody who you could look up to uh, in the way he carried himself, the way he yes. handled himself business-wise, musically. Uh, yeah. I think we, we need that. And I think at our age, we have to be that for the younger players, too. Right. Because there's a lot of that st- stuff is unspoken. You know, right. it's, a, it's a mentorship through observation. Right. And, you know, there's nothing ever that Tyrone Brown could have ever done that would have... Uh, not been uh, something that would exemplify what a musician, a professional, and a gentleman should be. Yeah. Absolutely, yeah. Well, that let's. Uh, I'm going to see. We're running over a little bit here. Very nice uh, choices of uh, clips, guys. All right, we have some questions. Hopefully, wait a minute. What we got here? A lot of this is insane humor. Superhuman. <laughs> She's a base. Steve Vescarone says, amazing. Um, oh, Steve Vescarone said, Lenny White thought Victor swung the hardest on electric. Uh, yeah, he saw, I mean, he could, I mean, it's funny because Victor would like, <laughs> we would talk about all of this stuff. Like, and he would say, like, he would go up to somebody who would remain nameless. They'll be on a festival and they'd have his acoustic. And Victor would just go up to the dude and say, yo, man, like, why you got that guy on the gig? You know, I swing harder than him. I mean, he would just go up there. Like, <laughs> and, 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 and he did. He probably did. I'm sure he did. You know, just, but, you know, at the time they were going through a thing and, you know, the acoustic, you know, music, whatever. But <laughs> you know, but he was one of the, ca- you know, he was one of the, I won't say the casualties, because he definitely, but I know that he wanted to play that music along with everything else. That's the thing about Philadelphia. We wanted, you know, it was a music town. We, you know, we, you know, we, you know, we all like, Jerry, you swing. I've heard you swing. You swing your <laughs> ass off. I mean, we all. Do. I mean, she, I mean, it's we because that's what we did. And I think a lot of it's because we play with. We talked about Jerry, like all these different drummers. 
And right. some guys play behind, you know, some the beat placement is different. You know, everybody <laughs> does different things. And we, I think as bass players, we just learn to adjust. We don't, we don't say anything. We just do it. Oh, oh he's on top or he's behind right. or he's doing this. We, we just do what we got to do. We just got to make, we just make it work. Sometimes Although there was that moment during the BET clip, I don't know if you caught it, when Frambro looked over at the drummer. <laughs> It might have been. Yeah, yeah. It was that quick yeah. Like, yeah. what are you doing over there? Yeah, yeah. But that's what well, the thing is. I mean, that, that you get that a lot, and that's no. And like I said, I mean, I love the drummers. You know, I mean, I love drummers. I mean, bass and drum. That's a that's a that's a marriage, a musical marriage. Thing. So, it's but the thing is, you know, you yeah. I guess that's just something that we've just done because we have so many different styles. Everybody's an individual, and that's a good thing. There there are no clones. You know, so and there are no clones on bass. None of us sound the same, but you hear right. that same lope. You, you heard all of it from Tyrone. You could hear the thread from from him to what Jimmy Garrison was doing. You right. could hear some maybe the, the the sound of the instruments change, but the roles from Derek Hodge, they all were kind of doing the same thing. You know, Victor's thing was a little bit more exact, but I'm sure you know it's not like he couldn't. That was just a different example, but you could see a common thread. Everybody was grooving. Nobody was like out of pocket, you know. Yeah, Mike. What's interesting is, like you said, you can see the continuity, but until tonight, the way I'm glad you chose these particular bass players, guys. And nobody, I mean, these guys chose these, and the differences are amazing, and it's it just shows the shows the extensive range of uh, musical expression on the bass itself. You know what I mean? Yes, Whether it's yeah. Tyrone stick bass or so, you know. But, uh, all right, we have a question here uh, from Chico Huff. He wants, anyone remember Andre's story? Yeah, yeah, I, don't, I, yeah I knew Andre's story. I mean, wonderful bass player, kind of more known as a great R&B player, but... Um, you know, just someone with a deep groove and could play anything. I mean, just someone who uh, you could put him in a situation and he would shine. Um, yeah, Andre's story. Yeah, unfortunately, you know, we, we've had some, you know, some losses and some folks who have, yeah, I don't even know what to say about it, but it's just, um, you know, I think it's, it's important for us to just kind of celebrate these musicians. So as often as we can do these things, that's why it's so important, Suzanne, what you're doing, because, um, yeah, we can easily lose players and we can lose the legacy. Right. And so we have to it's almost like in bringing up these names in conversation, it um, it re enlivens their work and it, it helps us it's almost like having a visit like playing a, a victor bailey clip and talking about victor bailey is almost like having a visit with a victor bailey right and i could say the same thing with uh about you know andre's story or i didn't know jocko personally but you know you 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 read the books you watch the videos you hear people tell stories and you feel that much closer to these mm -hmm. great musicians that's right well, uh, we we were lucky to have two great musicians here tonight to talk about them. And uh, I just wanted to mention, it looks like Al Gates, uh, he put something in here about, uh, I think he said he's Charles Fambrell's brother-in-law. <laughs> and wow. he, that, that clip that you had of Fambrell was from BET. And wow. BET gave him that that oh. particular um chico uh chico huff says i was lucky to hear andre many years ago um all right well i wanted to uh, is there anything uh you guys would like to say to close out before i go into the important website you should look for or? well i was just going to say that um again i want to thank you because the base is you know, out of all the instruments that Philadelphia is known for and the instrumentalists, um, we are really known as a bass town. So I think this kind of underscores the fact that, you know, we've had basses of all styles and all stripes and uh, going back decades and bass players coming along now who are just continue to make a contribution. So, you know, lifting them up, I think is super important. 
you know, when, when I go outside of Philadelphia, people talk about, in terms of base towns, they talk about Detroit, they talk about Philly, yeah. you know? I mean, I'm sure it's not to put down other towns, but there's something special about these particular kind of, uh, maybe it's the working class spirit here that yeah. just makes people dig the heart, uh, dig deeper. Yeah. But um, for me, I'm honored to be a part of that, that line of bass players and uh, it's very, very humbling. And it's, uh, yeah, it's a deep responsibility. Yeah. How about you, Mike? Yeah, everything you said, I mean, it's funny when I moved here um, with my, with my future ex-wife <laughs> uh, and, and I came to Philly back and it was like, I, I wow, I just, I really didn't like it, but I knew that there was a lineage here and it, I, I, like I said, I, I met some people and I, I'm just blessed. I mean, just fast forward and it was a blessing that I came here and I'm, I'm just honored and humbled because, you know, um, it's, we just have this is a music town and it's just like the, the bass player thing it, it's a heavy responsibility because they 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 know you're from philly they expect it's gonna it's gonna swing it's gonna be it's gonna be right and it's cool i mean it's a response but that's what we do i mean that's what that's just what it is that's just there's no you know and it's like that's just what that's just what it is and all the guys i mean everybody that that, that does it that they come through here that's what they and it's not and you, if you if you come if you spend some time here you know it's not like you have to be i wasn't born here you know but you definitely have to spend some time and just deal with all these drums just deal with the situation and just make it happen and you know it's a, it's a, it's, a, it's rewarding it has its reward and so i'm just honored and humbled to be on this lineage. I mean, with somebody like Gerald and, you know, all the other folks, it's like, wow, you know, and Chico and Steve and whoever else is out there. I mean, we're, we're all, you know, we're brothers. I love Philly bass players. I, I, I love us all. I, I'm serious. I'm, 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 I'm serious. I, I, I don't care. It doesn't matter what you play. I love you if you're from here. Because I know from the area, it's not necessary. Because I actually live in Wilmington, <laughs> but that's we we know we 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 do what we do, and I love us. <laughs> and we and we love you, Mike. I have to say, yeah, you know, we do. Thank you, man, for being like uh, someone who you give so much to the community. You know, you just have such a big heart for mentoring and serving. Even while you're swinging, you're serving. I don't know how you do, but you keep serving and you keep setting an example and uh, you're pulling, you know, the next generation up behind you. And that's on all instruments, you know, just being a mentor and being a light man. Love you so much. Same here, Joe. All right. Well, let me, uh, let me, um, Give, uh, I want to thank both of you for doing this tonight. It really has been a wonderful thing, and we will be editing it just a just a tad. Um, <laughs> to uh, it will be shown on channel sixty four, and it will also be on our YouTube channel in about a week or two after we edit it. Now let's put up the important. There we go. There's Gerald Beasley's website where you can buy a CD um, or find out what he's doing next. And just below that is Mike Boone's Facebook page. Now, just to warn you, sometimes he's kicked off there. Because <laughs> <laughs> Mike gets kind of excitable. <laughs> so, who, who but, me? But, who, who moi? <laughs> moi there's, a, I... there's always something doing on his Facebook page, so definitely visit it. And the last... Um, um, the last uh, is, is, of course, the Philadelphia Jazz Legacy um, website. So please go on there and sign up for our newsletter. Um, now, the last one, Lex. I want to thank Lex, who's our tech for today uh, and for every time we do this. Yeah, Lex. And your, your Great tax job, Lex. Yeah, donation bro. will help the community build the Philadelphia Jazz Archive for everyone to enjoy. And this conversation tonight will be part of that archive. So after we're pushing up Daisy someday, there'll be plenty of young bass players who will be coming to check this out. Yeah. Um, and so there's a little donation page, drop your $5 or whatever in there for us. And we are finance, uh, fiscally sponsored by Ars Nova Workshop. So it's tax deductible. 
And again, I want to thank everybody for coming out tonight. Uh, Daryl Beasley, thank you so much. Mike Boone, thank you. Steve Bescarone and Chico, thanks for showing up. Uh, Bescarone, mm -hmm. just to close it out, he says, beautiful presentation, everybody. Stirred up a lot of great memories. It's a badge of honor to be a Philly bass player. And I agree, Steve. <laughs> Yes, indeed. All right. Good night, everybody. Thank Good you. Good night, everybody. Take care. Take care, everybody. Thank All you. Right. <laughs> bye bye. All right.